Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome. My name is Tammy Charles, and I'm the outgoing executive director here at Aspen Public Radio. And I'm so pleased to be able to represent our NPR member station right here in the heart of the Roaring Clark Valley. I'm really grateful for everyone's participation and for taking time today to join us with, for this really amazing event. We're so honored to partner with our friends at Challenge Aspen to host NPR All Things Considered host Mary Louise Kelly. This is our second event with Challenge Aspen. And as you may recall, we worked with them in September to host NPR Weekend Edition host Scott Simon, where we discussed his book, Sunnyside Plaza, and how he learned how kindness started from within. We're really excited to once again collaborate in, in such a meaningful way uh, on, on this event for our Valley and to highlight issues that help give everyone a voice. Today's event is no exception. I'll be talking with Mary Louise Kelly in just a few moments about her work as a journalist and how she has gracefully adapted to what she has described as profound hearing loss. We think this is such an interesting and important issue to, to highlight, particularly, uh, particularly in, the, in this era of mask wearing and social distancing, as well as reflecting Challenge Aspen's mission as well. Uh, we made sure that captioning options are, are available today for participants. Uh, we're working with our captioner right now, so it should be appearing for you. Uh, the captions will be located at the bottom of your screen. If you are having an issue, you can uh, just send a message in the chat and our producers uh, will work to make sure everything is working for you. Uh, attendees can click on the closed caption button. That's how you'll find it. It's at the bottom uh, to open up subtitles on your individual device that you're watching us on right now. If you're having any issues, of course, like I said, I just want to reiterate that you can submit uh, your problem in the Q&A box and Lisa will be helping to make sure that that's available again. Uh, so before I introduce Mary Louise Kelly, I just want to uh, say very much welcome and we'll hear a few words from Gary Shala from Challenge Aspen. Gary. Well, thank you, Tammy. Thank for this time together. You know, working with uh, Aspen Public Radio, Challenge Aspen is really working to break down those misconceptions and those stigmas around the public's understanding of those living with disabilities. Our conversations last October with NPR Scott Simon and now thankfully with the highly accredited Mary Louise Kelly really highlight challenges uh, each of us face in life and in community. And so how together, you know, how we together with understanding and forgiveness and inclusion and in Challenge Aspen's case in providing adaptive experiences and opportunities how each of us has the ability to really redefine our limits. Challenge Aspen's been around for over 25 years. And in that time, we've served over 14,000 participants and we've addressed over 150 different disabilities. Challenge Aspen really enables individuals and veterans living with disabilities to experience outdoor adaptive sports on a year round basis. We provide them with the confidence and the self-esteem to really be more independent and live active lives moving forward. Our number one goal is inspiration. And secondly, to break down those barriers associated with year round outdoor activities for the disabled, to create life changing positive experiences that really build balance and increase endurance and physical fitness, enrich coordination and motor skills, and most importantly, positively influence creativity and, and imagination. And finally, we enable individuals to be heard, understood, and so they can freely express themselves without judgment when otherwise they may not get this chance. So Mary Louise Kelly, thank you for being with us today. We all look forward to hearing your story and for you being able to hear our questions. Thanks so much and welcome. Thank you so very much. Uh, I did get a note here in um, the panelist chat that they are working on the captioning right now. So please stand by for that. Uh, we are recording the session and we will make that available. And um, like I said, our, our captioner is uh, working to get in to make that happen for everyone. They're having some technical problems on the other end. So thank you for your patience. Um, so you know, we've, we've also asked, we want to hear from the audience as well and hear from, from you what your questions are 
um, for Mary Louise Kelly. And so if you would like to, you can put that into the chat box that is in the bottom of your screen and we will have uh, our producers look at that and, and convey that to me so I can ask those questions from you all to Mary Louise Kelly. Um, so I'm going to introduce someone who really needs no introduction. Uh, you can hear her weekly on uh, weekdays on NPR's All Things Considered. She's one of the most respected journalists of our time. She's been with NPR since 2001 and is truly an asset to public media. She's the co-host of All Things Considered, NPR's award-winning weekday afternoon news program. You can hear In the Valley here on our station from 3.30 to 6 p.m., Monday through Friday. Uh, and if you listen just a few weeks ago, we're going to find out today if Mary Louise is planning to change the name of the show to Newsy Things Considered. So stay tuned uh, for more on that. <laughs> Previously, Mary Louise has spent a decade as a national security correspondent for NPR News, uh, taking all things considered to, to Russia, North Korea, and beyond. Kelly graduated from Harvard University in 1993 with a degree in government, French language, and literature. She's also an alumna of Cambridge University in England. Her past reporting has her tracking the CIA and other spy agencies, terrorism, wars, and rising nuclear powers across the globe. She first launched NPR's Intelligence Beat in 2004. She also writes spy fiction, having debuted her espionage novel, Anonymous Sources, in 2013 about journalist spies in Pakistan's nuclear security. She wrote her second novel, The Bullet, in 2015. Her writing has also appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Politico, and the Atlantic, and of course, countless others. She's lectured at Harvard and Stanford and even taught a course on national security and journalism at Georgetown University. She serves as a contributing editor at the Atlantic, moderating newsmaker interviews at forums from right here in Aspen all the way to Abu Dhabi. She's worked as a producer for CNN and a reporter for the BBC World Service. Kelly's also a mom and recently spoke to the TED Radio Hour this past fall about living with profound hearing loss, which is going to be some of the focus of today's discussion. I think I speak for all of us when I say we are huge fans of Mary Louise Kelly. Please welcome her. It's an absolute honor to meet you virtually and spend some time learning more about your life and career. Thank you so very much for being here. Tammy, thank you so much. That was so sweet um, and uh, a lovely introduction. And it's just my total pleasure. My only regret is that I can't be there in person. I mean, I say that I, I miss doing everything in person, but particularly an invitation from Aspen the first <laughs> of March. <laughs> it's like the one that I wish was, <laughs> was in person and I could hit the slopes tomorrow. Um, not only be sitting here mournfully watching you know, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, we'll have to have you back, definitely. So, um, so talking a little bit about your hearing loss, um, one, one quote that I, I read uh, on, uh, from an article that you written, participated in was that the interesting thing about going deaf is that you don't realize it's happening. Um, you said it's impossible to pinpoint when everyone began to mumble, when you ceased hearing your own footsteps clicking down a hall. Um, do you remember when it started to become something in your mind where, where you were like, hmm, that's different, or I missed this, or, or how, how did you experience really ex these missing sensations from, from your life? Uh, it's, it's, it is fascinating because people ask, when did you realize you were going deaf? And I think, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if, did I have this as a kid and just not know it? I don't think so. Um, but to the point that, that you just made, it is a little different from vision. I also wear contacts and glasses and cannot see two feet in front of me without them. Um, but in that case, I think you figure it out earlier. You're looking at a book and you can't read it, um, or you're looking at a billboard and realize, you know, your son can read it and you can't, I should maybe get my eyes checked. With hearing, other people seem to hear things that I couldn't hear, but it's, it's less black and white. And um, 
I did have an increasing sense that everyone mumbled all the time, that I could not understand just conversations happening around me at a dinner party, uh, talking on the phone. That said, I was living in Italy at the time, and it seems funny, but I, I thought, how much of this is that I've just not, my Italian isn't as good as I wish it was, and how much of it is that I really can't hear you? Um, it was driven home as we moved back to the US from Italy. I published my first book. I went on a book tour. And when you think about occasions, you can fake a lot at a cocktail party, kind of nod along and only catch half of it. When you are in front of a microphone and somebody's asking you a question in front of a crowd and I can't crank my headphones the way I can in my day job, and I'm every other question thinking, I don't know what they just asked. And I'm, you know, asked, looking at my husband, who's hopefully in the front row and can kind of relay it to me, but you can only do that so many times before you start thinking, okay, really, the rest of you all heard that and I can't hear that? This is humiliating. I can't, I can't do my own book talk. Um, and I went and got my hearing checked. It was not a total surprise. There's a genetic component to this, as many of you know, and my father uh, wore hearing aids and needed them... Um, not quite as early as I did, but in his 50s. So I was looking at middle age and thinking this may be headed, I may be heading that way. Um, but I was surprised. I, to this day, can pass with flying colors the test that they give most of us. I think you go in for your annual physical and they say, raise your hand if you can hear the beep. I can hear the beep. No problem. It's not a volume thing. I, I do need some help with volume. But um, my main thing is I cannot distinguish between consonants and it's getting worse it's getting worse every year when i go back and retest um and so one of the tests in the more expanded you know uh, audiologist audiologist exam was just the doctor standing there and saying i'm gonna say a word repeat it seesaw mm -hmm. I said, seesaw mm -hmm. so you know park bench park bench i got it um I think I got, I can't remember exactly, but maybe 16 or 17 out of 20, something like that. It wasn't perfect, but it wasn't horrendous. And then he did the same test like this, talking to me like this, so I couldn't see his lips. Different words. And I think I got like four out of 20. I mean, just realized without having been aware of it that I had learned to read lips and I was relying on context and I was, to be honest, faking it a lot, just, you know, kind of nodding along and pretending I could understand when I couldn't. Um, and I needed hearing aids and I had probably needed them for a while. And that was uh, a few years ago, I was 43. Wow. Um, yeah, that's, I can imagine that it, it, it not being a sudden change that it would, it would sneak up on you like that. Um, what do you, how do you feel like your experience is living with an, an, an invisible disability to a certain extent. I, I read a little bit that um, you'd be talking to people and, and sometimes they would um, give you a bored look, you know, from them with, with an lip reading and trying to ask questions and things like that. Right. Uh, yeah, it's obviously very different from rolling up in a wheelchair where everyone can see what the situation is. Um, I wear hearing aids, both ears. I'm wearing them now. I anchor the, uh, you know, nightly broadcast of all things considered wearing them and wear them all the time. Um, but they're so great. You know, they really are tiny now. You have to look for them. Even with my hair up, most people never notice and have no idea. Um, which does not mean that I hear perfectly. They help a lot, uh, a lot, but um, you know, in this current moment, for example, where we're all wearing masks, again, it's the, right. I can't see your lips. And yeah. the better the mask, the more it muffles the sound. If you're wearing an N95, <laughs> I mean, this, this comes up regularly in, um, in my job on Friday. I interviewed the director of national intelligence. We did it in person. We do relatively few in-person interviews mm. these days for obvious reasons. Um, everything is happening via Zoom um, and Facebook Live and various other things. Um, we arranged to do this in person. We had a big discussion over if we had all tested negative, uh, whether the DNI and I could take our masks off if we were 10 feet apart long microphone poles. And she preferred not to um, for public 
you know, for safety and health risk reasons. And also we had a photographer and she did not want to be photographed in any way, you know, without a mask and making it look like she was doing business without a mask, which makes total sense. Mm -hmm. But I will share that as I didn't even kind of flag my producers about it, but I was driving there thinking, I hope I can hear her. I hope I can hear this because we normally in normal times I could lean in, I could get closer. Mm -hmm. You can't. Um, I can't ask her to take her mask off. I normally am wearing, you know, these are the hearing the headphones that I wear for the show every night and I can crank them loud, but I'm not going to be wearing headphones because I'm sitting across a conference room table and she's soft-spoken. What happens if I can't hear the director of national intelligence and I'm trying to flip this for the A segment of ATC in two hours? Um, fortunately, I could hear, but you never quite know. And I've had moments covering rallies, big protests, things where it is loud, um, where it's, it's tough. That, um, do you think, do you think people have been accommodating to you? Do you, do you tell them that to somebody that you're interviewing right away? Um, when I need to, okay. uh, not that it's a secret or something I'm hiding, but most of the time it feels just irrelevant. Um, again, in normal times, when I'm doing interviews all day for NPR, I'm sitting in a studio that on the one hand, it's crazy. My, I can't hear very well. And my job is to listen to you all day and try to ask follow-up questions based on what I've heard. Um, it works because the flip side is it's the perfect environment for somebody who struggles with this. I'm in a, the highest, most professional grade soundproofed studio. <laughs> there is not a pin dropping anywhere else that you can hear when you're in the, the big NPR studios wearing professional quality headphones that I can turn loud. It's perfect. I can hear you. Um, in, you know, these times I have had to make accommodations and just explain, I, I can't hear you and here's why. Um, I, it's funny, you know, it's, I got asked the other day uh, to participate in a panel um, uh, of people talking about various disabilities and I had to stop and think, I've never thought about it that way. And I realized this is, this is a controversial thing in the, community of people uh, who are deaf or suffer hearing loss. Um, I've never thought about it that way because I suffer so little compared to what so many people, the, the obstacles they put up with. It's mostly correctable with hearing aids. I've never felt discriminated against. Um, people have been very accommodating when I've needed it. Mm -hmm. And I guess I've always kind of thought of it as, you know, I wear contacts. I don't, I don't think of anybody walking around in glasses as disabled. So why would this be different? Um, but that's the key question. Have I ever had to ask for accommodation? Yes, I do all the time. Doing interviews from home now that we're not in the studio, we've jerry-rigged all kinds of ways to make it sound like we're in the studio. But there are certain things that my co-hosts, that Ari Shapiro or Audie Cornish can do that I can't do because my hearing aids get feedback with the, you know, the gear they're trying to give me. And I've had to explain that and producers have had to figure out different ways to work with me that makes their life harder. Um, and they have done so cheerfully and you know, to my eternal gratitude, but that's, you know, do I have a disability? Yeah. If you think about it that way, I need accommodations to do my job and um, have been pretty not shy about asking for them because I don't mm -hmm. really have a choice. <laughs> I yeah. love this job. I want to keep doing it. And I right. need to hear you. Right. Yeah. That I can, that just sort of with your level of experience and involvement and connection, it just, it just makes sense to me, you know, that, that you would really need to advocate for that. And I'm, I'm so glad that, you know, obviously I'm sure your colleagues and producers want you to succeed. So they're, they're able to, you know, ask you and come up with different ways, you know, yeah. to, to be able to help you do your job better. So um, that's, that's really, that's inspiring that there's people around, you know, you that want you to be you. And it's um, almost always a way. And I'm well aware that, you know, I, I'm the host of All Things Considered. I, you know, I, I um, have a whole team of people that, yes, wants to make sure I can hear and wants to make sure that these interviews get on the air. Um, and I, I think about it a lot. We had an intern um, who came to NPR and worked on the national desk a couple of years ago. Um, 
who identifies as deaf and whose parents are both deaf. And she said she came to NPR after she read something I'd written about it. And she said, I never thought I could do a career in radio. But hell, if you can like actually anchor the evening news when you can't hear, I can come be an intern. And I thought, hell yeah, you can. You can, you can do this. You can do just about anything you want to do. This is a crazy job for someone who's hearing impaired to try to do. Um, but you make it work uh, with, with the help of many, many, many people. So I think about that and I think about how important it is for, for the intern to feel like they can speak up and ask for that help too. Um, so maybe do you have some suggestions for people who are maybe new to hearing loss or just in the, in the beginning phases and, and can relate to some of the things that you've, t you've talked about how, um, suddenly some words weren't getting through or you found yourself, you were relying on, on making sure that you saw people's faces. So, um, what are some, maybe some more suggestions for people who are kind of struggling with uh, adapting right now? Yeah. I think, you know, the, the biggest thing is just go get it checked. If, if you're clearing your annual physical with flying colors, you may be doing great. Hats off, more power to you. But I, again, that is the case for me, and I clearly need hearing aids. Um, you know, I, I hate to ever tell anybody to add another item to your to-do list, but um, it is worth for all of us, you know, just getting the baseline from, from a audiologist just doing the hour-long test um, so that you know. I mean, one of the things I have learned is that almost none of us hear the way we did when we were 18. <laughs> almost everyone over the age of 40, I mean, really almost everyone over the age of 40 would probably benefit from some slight form of hearing aid. Um, and now they're small, and they Bluetooth into my phone and everything else. We all walk around with, you know, AirPods in anyway. So I think within a couple of years, um, you know, we'll, who will know the difference? They all just look the same. We're all walking around with things in our ears. Um, you know, it, I was embarrassed for about a week, the stigma. It felt like this is something that happens to old people. I'm just being honest. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm 43 years old and I shouldn't have to wear hearing aids. And then I got them and realized, oh my God, I have been missing so much. I had no idea. Um, I realized, it's just gonna make me cry, but I realized I had been driving my sons, you know, around just carpool to school, to soccer practice. And they're in the back seat because they're kids and they can't sit in the front and they're chattering the whole way. And I hadn't been able to hear it for, I don't know how long. And I got hearing aids and realized, oh my God, they're talking about what happened today and they're cracking jokes and they're singing songs and they're talking about, you know, the soccer goal they want to score tonight. And I have missed all of this. Yeah. It is not worth missing this stuff and it is not necessary. It's, um, you know, I wish I didn't have to wear these, but you get used to them pretty fast. And um, for me, they have changed my life. I'm, I'm so glad you got that time back, you know, with your children in the back of the car. I'm one of one of four kids and we were plotting to take over the neighborhood um, and various things. And um, I just, uh, I, I can only imagine having that sort of, you're, you're let into their world um, when maybe they're not super aware of it, you know, and um, I, I'm so glad that you're able to get that back. I can only imagine that's an important part of going through childhood. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe do you have any ideas about how we can make journalism more inclusive? I'm, I'm really heartwarmed by the intern, you know, a story that was, can I, I can do this. Right. And um, so is there more accessibility um, that could maybe help people who are interested in a, a journalism career, especially audio journalism? That's an excellent question. I mean, I do think it's, this is not something that I set out to, uh, you know, write about or speak about. Um, but the few times I have, it has gotten such an enormous um, response. I think just a lot of people don't talk about hearing in particular. 
Um, in my case, I felt like it was a nuisance and a hassle. And then I got hearing aids and I kind of resolved it. And so, you know, why do I need to speak about this? Um, but you do need to speak about it because there's so, so, so many of us, particularly now mask social distancing um, for whom this is harder. And um, so that's one thing, having, you know, role models out there who speak about it and to whom it's just doesn't seem to be that big a deal and seems to be a surmountable challenge. Um, as I say, it's not perfect, um, but it's, you know, what is? <laughs> Who of us has a perfect life with no challenges? <laughs> this, is, this is something you, you deal with. I think that's part of it. Um, you know, and the, uh, this is, I guess, an obvious point, but the technology which does make things possible that just was not possible um, before. Um, I remember going out um, for one of the few reporting trips where I managed to make it um, you know, outside of my home office where I broadcast from every day now, um, was last June when the protests um, were really exploding across the country. And I grew up in Georgia, uh, in Atlanta, and I wanted to go to Atlanta um, where they had had a, a horrible night. I think this was June 1st, June 2nd, I can't remember. Um, and just see how this was playing out in the cradle of the civil rights movement. And that was very challenging from you know, the point of view of the protests, um, which were challenging to cover and violent and you know we were issued uh, body armor to go cover them flag you know helmets and flak jackets and all the rest which is you know I, i've worn that stuff in iraq and afghanistan it is really crazy to have that issued to go report from your hometown so there's that there's the covid aspect of you're in a crowd <laughs> some people are better about wearing masks than others um, we had our microphones that were covering in saran wrap so that we could wipe them down with Clorox wipes after every interview. Um, so just all of the, you know, uh, thinking that went into trying to make sure that my team and I were not going to get sick or get anybody else sick. And then the third thing of, you know, you're in the middle of a big protest, which is super loud and there are tear gas canisters going off around you and people are screaming and throwing things. And that's part of what you're there to capture. But I can't, again, <laughs> how do I hear you? Um, and there are accommodations that go with that. Some, you know, the microphone that we choose to use partly to capture sound, but also, you know, I'm... Uh, I think most correspondents wouldn't be wearing their headphones in the field, and I am because I can hear, you know, they're piping the sound directly in from, we call it a shotgun mic, because it looks like it's like a long barrel and it's aimed and it's recording just the very tip and trying to filter out all of the extra noise around so you can actually hear somebody in the middle of a really loud crowd. Um, most of my colleagues would just be, you know, interviewing like that, and I've got it piped straight into professional headphones so that it's I can hear things that you know I would never otherwise be able to hear, um, and and then also the you know the technology of my hearing aids, which is every year getting better um, in terms of being able to do some of the remote things that I'm doing right now. Um, Zoom calls are really tough for me with my whole old hearing aids for boring reasons. Um, these work, and I'm piped straight into my laptop, and I can hear you, which is exciting. <laughs> Great. That's, that's so many challenges at once. Um, so I just wanted to switch gears a little bit to talk more about your journalism, your fascinating journalism career. What, what inspired you to, to take on this field? Journalism in general? Yeah. I always thought it just seemed like the coolest job ever. <laughs> I always have loved to write. Um, I started a neighborhood newspaper uh, the Lemons Ridge Bugle. I lived on Lemons Ridge. This is when I was about 12. And we had a, like a yard of the month that you got a <laughs> yard if you won. And we wrote, you know, explosive articles about the latest house for sale on the corner. <laughs> my neighbor's, you know, cake recipe and things like that. And I edited my high school paper and worked on my college paper and was kind of headed this way. Um, just thinking, what other job where I get to roam the world, talk to people who would never otherwise talk to me. I mean, they're, you know, today they don't talk to me, Mary Louise, they're talking to NPR, they're trying to reach our audience. That's why they talk to you. So it's a license to 
go places and ask people questions that you would never have the chance to ask um, or to read, you know, the latest Stephen King book and, and then get to talk to Stephen King for half an hour about it. How fun is that? And then I get to write about it and then I get to like broadcast it. That just sounded like the most fun thing ever. And it has been, and it <laughs> remains that way. Um, I did, you know, have, as we all hopefully do as, you know, as I came out of high school and college, um, flirted with a bunch of other things. My dad was desperate for me to take the LSAT and go to law school. Um, I thought about teaching. I thought about management consulting. I thought about, in fact, I thought, I thought hard about management consulting. And I think probably if you asked me like, what was the one pivotal day I, when I was in grad school in England had, uh, two job interviews the same day. One was with McKinsey, the management consulting firm, and it was like a second or third round interview at their very posh, lovely offices on Oxford Circus in London. And it went fine, it was, it was good, uh, you know. Um, and I kind of thought, I, I could do this, and I can see that, you know, that the, the, this would be a worthwhile thing to do. Um, and I would make like, you know, I can't remember what the starting salary was, but as a, you know, 22 year old grad student, it seemed like beyond my wildest <laughs> dreams and I would have a secretary and like, this was the life. Um, but you know, okay. Um, and then I stopped and had a coffee and then I had my second interview, which was at the BBC at world service headquarters in London, where they were offering a starting salary that was probably 5% of what McKinsey was offering. <laughs> Uh, and I was never going to have a secretary and I was never going to have my own office. And they actually kept me waiting for like two hours before I got to meet who I was interviewing with because there was some huge story breaking in the Middle East and the newsroom was going crazy and everybody's running around and screaming and studio doors are slamming and you know the printer is like practically levitating off the desk and it's broken <laughs> as the copy's coming out. And, and I just remember sitting there thinking, Oh my God, I would pay you. <laughs> this is, I feel so alive. How fun is this? This is, how can I turn this down? Um, and so I didn't, and I went to work for the BBC and, and you know, that was in 95. Uh, and here I am. That's, that sounds like an extremely infectious, um, very different from walking into a law office. So I, I, I can vouch for that it is a very experience, <laughs> but I do still feel that. I really miss so deeply in my bones walking into a newsroom every day. It is not the same um, doing it from home. And I have had so many moments where, you know, I come up the elevator at NPR and the doors open, click on the third floor and I walk in and there's some story breaking yeah. um, and everybody's running around and I just, think, oh, thank God, this is what I chose. This is where I should be. I love it. We're, we're glad, we are glad, all of us are, who are listeners are glad um, that you stayed in broadcasting and chose that. I um, just wanna ask a quick question about, um, uh, you received a lot of attention for the interview you did with Mike Pompeo in 2020. Um, can you remind our audience a little bit about what happened in that, in that interaction with him? Sure. Uh, that was just over a year ago. I had been asking for an interview with Mike Pompeo for a while. That's part of my job. And um, I was in Tehran in January of last year and finally got the note from the State Department offering me a date and time to sit down with him. And um, it was like two weeks, two weeks from then. And um, so I thought, great. This is fabulous. I just interviewed the foreign minister of Iran uh, in Tehran. And so it was the chance to do the kind of book into that and interview the equivalent, the U.S. Secretary of State in Washington. Um, we, you know, in preparation for the interview, uh, just swapping notes with his press team. And um, I never give out my questions in advance, never say this is what I'm gonna ask this and then I'm gonna ask this, obviously, because 
aside from anything else, it would lead to a really boring interview. If you've prepped your questions and they've prepped their answers, you're not going to get you know, anything very exciting. Um, but also, you know, I always make a point of saying I, I will take nothing off the table because who knows what might happen overnight that I'm going to feel compelled to ask you about. But we kind of said, I said, I, I plan to focus the bulk of my questions on Iran um, because I'm just back from there. And you'll recall that a year ago, January, it looked like we might be on the brink of war with Iran. So it's an obvious thing to ask the Secretary of State about. Um, I also said I'm going to ask about Ukraine. Um, and they said, you got 10 minutes. Um, so we went in. We got 10 minutes. We sat down with him. It was a fairly contentious interview from the start because I was pushing him pretty hard on Iran. He, you know, if the goal is to keep Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, how are you going to do that? Because the U.S. has pulled out of the nuclear deal and Iran is now closer to having the capacity uh, to develop a nuclear weapon if they want to than they were when Trump took office. So what's the plan? Um, and you go into an interview like that, for me, um, with, you know, not, not a huge list of questions, just two or three questions. And on Iran, I, my main question was, how are you going to stop it from getting a nuclear weapon? What's the plan? You do go in with, you know, a whole having mapped out in my head, if I ask this, he could say this, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to need to point this out. And you go in, you know, prepared with all of the information, if it goes down this alley, I, you know, then here's my follow-up. If it goes down this alley, here's my follow-up. That all, we did what we did. We did spend the bulk of the interview on Iran. And then about, with about three minutes left, I said change of subject, Ukraine, and asked him if he owed Ambassador Marie Ivanovich an apology. And he did not want to talk about that. Um, to me, it seemed I would be remiss not to ask about Ukraine. He was the Secretary of State. He had been on the phone call, the famous July 25th phone call uh, that had led to the impeachment inquiry. And as he and I sat, that we were in the middle of a Senate impeachment trial for the President of the United States, which was centered on Ukraine and on testimony from State Department officials. So the idea that I wouldn't ask about it, particularly since I told them I was going to ask about it, okay, he didn't want to talk about it, and I kept asking. And um, he became very angry. Uh, his aide ended the interview. Um, again, I mean, it was, we were practically at 10 minutes, but it was clear. She said, we're, we're done. Um, I thanked him. He did not. He said nothing. He leaned in. He glowered at me um, and left the room. And then um, as we're packing up, a few moments later, the same aide came back and said, would you come with me? Nobody else, none of your team. I'm there with a producer and an editor and Michelle Kellerman, our State Department correspondent and a writer who's going to write this up for the website, for digital. No one else come and no, no gear. No, you know, no, no recorder. I said, fine. And I went back and in his private living room at the State Department, uh, he yelled at me for about 10 minutes, um, swore at me and uh, accused me of having... Uh, set up the interview under false pretenses. Um, he said, you, you, I only agreed to talk about Iran. And I said, you absolutely did not. We had nothing <laughs> that was on or off the table. Um, he did not, he asked, um, you know, do you think Americans effing care about Ukraine? Um, couldn't even find it on a map. Could you even find it on a map? I said, well, I could, but that's not the point. If you have a specific question you want to, you know, object to, I'm happy to hear it. Um, and he called out and had his aides bring us an unmarked map with um, not only no names of countries, but no borders, nothing, just blob land masses, sheet of paper. Um, and I pointed to Ukraine and he put the piece of paper away and said, people will hear about this. And he swore at me a little bit more. And then he said he had things to do. And I thanked him again and left. Um, and immediately went, we have a, a bureau and a desk at the State Department uh, where we had been filing, we had, we had been planning to file had there been, you know, news from this interview, which we thought there probably would be, we were going to update Morning Edition. Um, I will say it was the only time I have in the U.S. had occasion 
to worry about the tape. Were they going to let me out of the building with the tape? Wow. Wow. Uh, I've worried about that in Russia, in North Korea, in Iran, <laughs> places like that. I've never had occasion to worry about it in the U.S. government building in the United States of America. Um, but my focus was getting, making sure the producer slammed it into the computer and uploaded it to the mothership before anything happened, which we did. And I went live and talked to Rachel Martin about it, um, about the, the Iran and Ukraine parts of the interview that was on tape. And just to, the last thing on this is just to say, they never you know, asked for our after conversation to be off the record. I never would have agreed for it to be off the record. It was not on tape. Um, but I had come to the State Department that day to interview the Secretary of State. That was the purpose of my visit. And as far as I was concerned, if he wanted to continue the interview in his private living room, fair. Um, but I, 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 we really thought hard about, do we include this coda? Do we include the map thing? How do we report that? We don't have tape. Um, what is the news value in it? I mean, I always think about that. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm, you know, yeah. he can, he can yell and swear at me all he wants. It is, I, you know, it, it's still my job to take the high ground and I don't want to report anything for the sake of embarrassing someone. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, it felt relevant and newsworthy because this is the secretary of state. His job is promoting democratic values abroad, American democratic values abroad, which include respect for a free press. Mm -hmm. And um, it felt relevant to include, this is, this is how this person behaves when interacting with credentialed journalists who have been invited to the State Department and who have asked appropriate and respectful questions. This is news. So we reported it just straight. We called the State Department beforehand and said, we plan to include this coda. Do you have any comment? They did not provide any. Um, it aired and then the next morning, um, Secretary Pompeo on State Department letterhead issued a statement calling me a liar and things kind of moved from there. That's, that's got to be um, extremely frustrating um, on so many levels as, as, a, as a journalist and especially as you referenced, you know, in America where free press is part of the, the basis of, of our country. Um, so I, I commend you for doing, for doing your job um, and yeah. asking the questions and um, you know, reporting on the state of our government in some ways, right? That, that's, that's your job is, is to hold government officials accountable. Um, so I, while that I'm sure was just so challenging on so many levels, um, I'm, I'm very grateful that, that you were able to just share the story to the public. That's, that's the job of the press. So, I'm um, grateful you able to do the interview, and and um, it is it is you're just doing the job, right, you know, right. And ask fair questions, and if someone isn't answering them, you ask them again. Um, that is the job, and um, there were a lot of people who wanted answers to those questions. And again, Mike Pompeo doesn't need to take any time to tell to speak to me. But it felt he owed some answers to Americans and, and to be honest, to, to the people who work for him, who worked for him in, in the State Department, um, because he had not taken questions on Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, and it felt like, felt like we should put those two on. So we did. Thank you. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time. And uh, so I do absolutely want to leave some time for questions from people. Um, but, uh, you know, since we referenced earlier the all uh, newsy things considered, uh, to, to end on a little bit of a high note, can, can you tell us about your interaction um, with the paleontologist Leo? Leo is eight years old. Speaking of kids being driven around, driven around in back seats, <laughs> he apparently is constantly subjected to all things considered in the back seat as his parents are driving him around. And he wrote a letter to us saying, you, you're not all things considered, you're all newsy things considered. <laughs> news, news, news. Um, there aren't enough dinosaur stories. Why don't you do more cool stories like on dinosaurs? Sincerely, Leo. I'm paraphrasing, but that was the gist of it. And um, we read this and I think the whole staff just thought, yeah, excellent point. <laughs> 
to do more dinosaur stories too. Um, so Art Silverman, one of our senior producers, um, thought, how could, you know, should we have Leo on the show? Can we talk to him about dinosaurs? And it evolved um, into, we did have Leo on the show. I interviewed Leo and then we brought on a real life paleontologist, dinosaur scientist uh, from California and Leo got to interview him. He had awesome questions. Yes, yeah, he did. He did. <laughs> <laughs> he really, he really um, knows dinosaurs. The point where I ran out of time after like 20 minutes. I had another interview I had to get to, and they were still going. And when I checked back 15 minutes later, he, Leo is still brilliant. <laughs> it was awesome. Uh, so we aired that, and uh, it got huge feedback, and you know, retweeted by Hillary Clinton, and all, all kinds of feedback. But just um, people are still mailing our office dinosaur. <laughs> dinosaurs. Can you get this to Leo? We need Leo to get it. <laughs> Um, but a great lesson to all of us. All things considered should mean all the things. Uh, <laughs> the news can be so grim between pandemic yeah. and politics. Yeah. And, most of it. and uh, we all need a few dinosaur stories. So we yes. hear you. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, uh, fantastic. I, I so appreciate it. We, we talked about it in the office. Um, and so it was a, a moment um, of lightness that, that was needed. Um, so I've got a couple of questions here on the side uh, from our attendees. So we'll, we'll try to get to a few of them. Um, so we have a question that someone wanted to know if you used captioning apps or devices um, to help you in your work right now, especially. I should, and if anybody has recommendations, please ping me, mlkelly at npr.org, or you can tweet at me. Um, I'm sure that I should. Uh, I cannot watch TV without closed captioning and subtitles. I find it enormously useful. Um, I manage in ways that I can't fully explain for the most part to be able to hear uh, when I'm interviewing people, um, like when I'm you know, in front of a microphone with my headphones on, as I, as I have shared in the field, sometimes it's a little bit harder, but mm. in the field, you know, it's closed captioning is a little bit harder. Although there are now smartphone apps that, you know, I can hold it out and aim it at you and it's, coming in not perfectly but but like helpfully um so i would love to look at some of those that's that's really um that's amazing that's fantastic um if it's not in too intrusive we have a, a question here who was wondering about um were you able to identify the cause of your hearing loss um other than than genetic um and we this was coming from a person who worked in ent for 26 years um, and he also says, you're my daily companion. So wonderful to get to know you better. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, no is the short answer. It, this hearing loss runs in my family. Um, uh, my dad, my grandmother, we're waiting to see if my baby brother follows in these footsteps. Um, so there's that. I have spent time in war zones that were loud. Um, who knows? I have definitely probably exacerbated and hastened this along. Uh, as I say, I don't know exactly when this started, but you know, my whole career has been in broadcasting pretty much. And um, I'm sure that I was cranking headphones loud so that I could hear, um, which as we all know, cranking headphones too loud can damage your hearing. So I don't know how, how much of this is self-inflicted. Um, the only other theory I've ever come up with is when I was pregnant with my second son, I got a raging ear infection, strep throat, just everything. And they would not let me take antibiotics and because um, they were worried about um, my pregnancy. And I remember there were a few days where I felt like my ears were going to explode. Mm. There was just so much pressure and the infection was raging. And I have that was when I was in my mid thirties and I have wondered about that. Was there, was there some lasting damage from that? But the short answer is I have no idea and none of my audiologists have been able to pinpoint it. Um, so maybe um, when you've had a, a difficult day or afternoon, um, a question is how do you handle frustrated coworkers and or family that may be reacting to you asking more questions or um, how, how has that made you feel? Um, yeah, this is a thing. Uh, this is a thing in my own family where, you know, I, um, I can't hear something right away and, uh, you know, my family member will just say, oh, never mind. 
And I think, no, actually, I mind. <laughs> I do actually want to hear you and participate in this conversation. Can you turn and look at me? Um, and sometimes it's as simple as that. It's, you know, with my own family, I can lean in and get closer. Um, I can say, can you turn and so I can see your lips. Um, that helps um, with, you know, mumbling teenagers who legitimately do mumble. <laughs> it's not just me. <laughs> Snarling and mumbling is <laughs> Um, you know, I can crank my hearing aids. They have a, you know, buttons you can toggle louder or softer. Um, I, they are, you know, they're great. I'm so used to them now. I mostly forget about them. But for those of you who don't wear them, they are annoying. It's this thing sitting on top of your ear. Now between masks and sunglasses mm. and this, there's just no real estate left. Um, you know, if you think about it, they're uncomfortable. It reminds me, the women in here may appreciate or men who've got long hair, but it feels, you know, that feeling when you've had a tight ponytail all day and then you take it off. And, <laughs> oh, thank God. That's to me what it feels like to take my hearing aids out at the end of the day. Um, I wasn't even aware that it was annoying me until it went away. And then, oh, thank God. That's what it feels like every night, which I mentioned because, uh, you know, if I were left to my own devices, pottering around the house on a weekend morning, you know, before I'm doing interviews on a weekday morning, I would probably not put them in. But it's, it's a two-way street. I'm asking people to be respectful and accommodating of me, speak up, face me. Um, I feel like the least I can do is be respectful and accommodating of them and put in my hearing aids when I kind of really don't feel like it. I haven't brushed my teeth yet, but if I'm going to come down and make coffee and you're going to try to sort out the carpool logistics for the weekend, I should put my hearing aids in so that, you know, I can actually hear you and engage. So I think it, I think it goes, it goes both ways. Um, let's see, we've got a question here from someone who wants to know what comes to mind to you when you think about, one of your most phenomenal or meaningful or inspiring moments in your remarkable career or life. Oh my goodness. That's a lot to choose from. That's yeah. Uh, remarkable or inspiring moments. Um, you know, I mean, they're the, the, the big interviews that make headlines like a Pompeo type thing. Um, I suppose particularly driven home to me in this moment of pandemic and us all being shut inside our houses and craving human contact. It has been, it has been brought home just the, the, the power of radio and just connecting, you know, one human voice to another, um, across, you know, many miles, that power of humanity and contact, um, at the very beginning of the pandemic, before it was a thing here even, uh, when we were just starting to hear reports out of Wuhan, China, and Wuhan was being shut down and it felt like this far away thing in China that was obviously never gonna affect any of us. Um, we thought, well, we should hear from Wuhan and our correspondents in China couldn't get there because the city was locked down. So one of my intrepid producers started, you know, geo-tracking on Twitter. You can tell where people are tweeting from, trying to find anybody tweeting in English from Wuhan and found a guy who I interviewed the day that Wuhan locked down. And it ended up being less an interview than just a conversation between two people who could not be living more different lives in more different places. And he's describing just, you know, he's just been told he can't leave his apartment and he's worried about food and, you know, uh, worried about his dating life because he's not, he's like, I'm not married. And how am I going to date if I can't leave my house? I'm like, that is a problem. I can totally see. <laughs> um, we had just a lovely human conversation and we kept checking back with him over as the months and weeks unfolded and our lives went in opposite yeah. trajectories because Wuhan got this under control as the U S was falling off the cliff and you know, all of our lives were being an un unimaginable ways uh, being upended. And, um, you know, we, as we were talking in April and May, and he's able to leave the house and he's telling me he's getting into taxi and he's about to go get takeout pizza for the first time in four or five months. And he is so excited. And I'm thinking, meanwhile, I am now locked down and having to do this interview from my house because I'm not allowed to go into the newsroom or go anywhere or ever go anywhere, you know, near anybody or in a restaurant ever again is what it felt like. Um, 
but it was this human moment. And by the last conversation when I interviewed him, you know, he was, he was, had managed to figure out the dating thing and he wasn't engaged yet, but was saying, when I, when I am, when I get married, you're coming to the wedding. And I felt like <laughs> that was in Wuhan, China. Um, <laughs> And many, many people reacted to those conversations. There was zero news in there. I'm not sure you learned much of anything, but you felt two human beings who have never met and maybe never will, uh, if this whole wedding thing doesn't work out for them, um, but connecting. And those to me are the really powerful moments and they are the ones that radio does in a way that yeah. newspapers cannot hit. TV can't hit because you get caught up in what you look like and what the other person looks like. But Two human voices connecting around the world in the dark is a powerful thing, and I love it. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm going to look here. Um, so a question here from someone who, who says they're hearing impaired and they hate using the phone, which because I've worked in journalism has sometimes been necessary because I need to do the interviews. Uh, Zoom is a godsend because of the lip reading. Um, how do you cope with doing phone interviews um, with work? I'm assuming that many, some people don't have access to, to Zoom or computers or in the field and things like that. So, so how does working on a phone work for yeah, you? It's, it's like a million things. Um, it's not easy and you figure it out. Um, I mentioned the new hearing aids, which uh, I, there have been different generations of them coming for a few years now, but which I only got this past summer, I guess. Um, which Bluetooth. And so there's nothing, you know, I used to, until last summer when I got these, if I wanted to talk on the phone, I couldn't, my iPhone wouldn't go loud enough. Like the volume would not go loud enough that I could hear you even with hearing aids in. So I either had to put you on speakerphone, just super annoying to everyone around you and doesn't really work for an interview, or take my hearing aids out and put earbuds in, which would crank louder, but you know, then has other issues. Um, so it was a pain. This works better. Um, you know, Zoom, I, I could see in the question, Zoom, because you can see people's lips is helpful. And I think it's just, there are now so many different ways. Every interview I do, the one I was just wrapping as I came to y'all just now, um, you know, whether it's, whether it's Skype, whether it's FaceTime, whether it's NPR has an app to report it, which we use for a lot of interviews. None of them have closed captioning. I can't see the words. Um, but a lot of them, I can see lips now. And a lot of them, for whatever inexplicable reason, if I can't hear you on Skype, sometimes I can hear you on Zoom or vice versa. So it's about playing around with it a little bit. Um, I have not, knock on wood, had a problem where on the phone, I was unable to hear with these new hearing aids. With the old ones, it was a problem. So again, and I do see a question coming in from somebody about, you know, have I found an insurance company that covers hearing aids because they're really expensive? The answer is, amen, I agree, and I have not. I pay for them, and they're really expensive. Um, and it is ridiculous, in my view, that uh, glasses and contacts are covered by a lot of vision plans and that hearing aids are not. I don't have any sympathy for the argument that this is not a medical issue that it should be covered by insurance um they're necessary and i think if it was covered and was not so expensive there would be less stigma involved as well as reaching people who who has thousands of dollars just kicking around to spend on something that you're not 100 percent sure that you need um it's ludicrous that they are so expensive <laughs> and that they're not covered by by insurance that i have found so if anybody has tips on that let me know but um i know that there are you know lobbying efforts underway to try to get that changed. Um, but thus far, the, the better hearing aids are just expensive. Um, I, you know, I am fortunate in that I can pay for them and, and do because I'm well aware that I could not do my job without them. Well, we're very uh, smidge tiny over the top of the hour here. And uh, so I just wanted to say thank you, Mary Louise Kelly, everyone. Uh, she's on Aspen Public Radio during All Things Considered. Weekdays, 3.30 to 6.30. I just want to thank you, Mary Louise, once again for taking the time 
to speak with us. It has been a fantastic and fascinating conversation. Thank you so very much. Also to Challenge Aspen, of course, for their partnership on this event with us and for spearheading this discussion uh, as a series of events across our valley. We're so grateful to you, uh, Challenge Aspen, for your service that you provide to so many people here in the region. Uh, thank you again to Total Caption as well for providing captioning services today for our participants. Uh, we're planning to have a, um, a recording of this webinar. We'll make that available to people as well. And thank you to our board of directors, our national council, to all of our listeners and supporters for your role in ensuring that quality public radio journalism is available right here in our valley. Our own news team could not do what we do without you. And to all of our participants today, thank you for joining us for this free public virtual event. We hope to continue to engage with you throughout the rest of the year. And I'd like to say uh, thank you to our producers, Lisa Deloso, uh, back at Aspen Public Radio. Thank you for your help so much, Lisa, in getting this arranged and working with Challenge Aspen and our captioners. Um, and so thank you finally to all of you listening and viewing today for supporting Aspen Public Radio and Challenge Aspen. We're so very grateful for your support and for spending the afternoon uh, in great conversation with Mary Louise Kelly today. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you so much, Mary Louise. We'll hear from you later. Thanks.